Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Lisa Schwartz. We are right at start time, so I am going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Donna Knapp. Thank you, Lisa. And hi, everybody. Thanks for joining uh, us today. And I'm going to talk to you today about achieving high velocity IT. And I'm going to just kind of acknowledge up front that um, you're not supposed to have favorite children in this world, right? Um, but I actually have to say that of all of the Idle 4 publications, High Velocity IT is my favorite. And the reason it's my favorite is you can see from my credentials that I love learning. I am very much a lifelong learner. I, learn, I love learning different ways of working, different frameworks, different models, constantly challenging myself to kind of rethink my view of the world and, and then figure out how I can apply what I've learned um, to improving the way I work and, and, and to, as an educator, helping you all improve the way you work. And it is in high velocity IT that you really see these concepts come together more than um, in any of the other publications. Not to say they're not there in the other publications, but it all comes together in high velocity IT. So, I'm going to talk about what high velocity IT is, its key objectives, key behavior patterns, and key characteristics of high velocity IT. Now, before I do that, I, I just want to give some acknowledgement to Idle 4 and how Idle 4 truly is very different um, than Idle v3, Idle 2011 for a few reasons. One is that you see this emphasis on the co-creation of value. In fact, the very definition of the concept of a service has changed in that it speaks to enabling the co-creation of value as opposed to delivering value. It introduces best practices as well as exploratory ways of working. And you know, this is part of this is designed to help folks understand that adopt and adapt has always been part of our vocabulary when it comes to idle, and that there, there's very much emphasis on that, um, and, and even more so coming into idle 4. It's, idle has never been intended to be prescriptive and, you know, something that you take and you act on, you know, directly by the book and by introducing these exploratory ways of working, right? Ways that we can experiment, ways that we can um, kind of figure out what works best within our organization. That really makes IDLE 4 different. It is principles-based. The IDLE guiding principles are phenomenal and we've done, we've talked about the the, the principles in other of our Idle 4 presentations. It's value stream centric. And I want to emphasize this. This isn't to say that the processes have gone away. In Idle v3, Idle 2011, the focus was really intended to be a process oriented framework. And processes have now really just put, been put in their proce uh, proper place to understand that no one process can be effective if it isn't performing in the context of its greater value stream and in the context of other processes that it interrelates with. We all see, so see in Idle 4 the evolution to this concept of a practice, which really just helps us understand that it's not just about the process component itself, what we often visualize as the flowchart, but understanding that we have to think about the people aspect of things, the technology aspect of things, how we're uh, interfacing with our suppliers. And certainly with Idle 4, we see alignment with other ways of working like Agile and Lean and DevOps, and that's just to name a few. And I'm gonna talk in this session about other, other ways of working that we see being pulled into high velocity IT. So it's a very modern approach to IT service management. You know, we are talking about things like customer experience and value streams. Today, we're gonna to talk quite a bit about digital transformation and systems thinking. So it is a tremendous evolution in the framework 
that's very, very relevant to the way we're doing things in our organizations today. So this might be what some of you are experiencing right now. <laughs> um, we can't talk about high velocity IT without bringing the word digital into the conversation. And I love this quote from Louis Rossetto. He says, no product is made today, no person moves today, nothing is collected, analyzed, or communicated without some digital technology being an integral part of it. So digital has very much changed the game within our organizations, within our society. Uh, you know, look at the current uh, crisis that we're all living um, in today in the world and um, digital has made our lives infinitely better and those organizations that were positioned to um, work in digital ways um, are, 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 are doing much better than those organizations that hadn't um, hadn't acknowledged the importance of digital technology in this day and age. And it's been fascinating to me, and it may be fascinating to you as well, how quickly we've seen organizations responding um, in terms of being able to continue delivering their products and services uh, via digital technologies. So digital transformation is a thing, right? But I want to emphasize that it's not just an IT thing. So if you looked at if you look at the way we've worked historically in IT, we've we've had these silos for all intents and purposes. We've had an IT department, and we kind of manage that department very frequently as a cost center, and that's separate and distinct from the business units within the organization. And when this model is working at its worst, there's actually even competition uh, between those two parts of the organization. There's very much an us versus them approach to life. So when we talk about digital transformation, we have to understand that digital technology not only changes how we work within these different parts of our organization, they really also have to change the way we do business within those parts of our organization. And you see here that we have this evolution, and this is the initial evolution to undergoing an IT transformation and undergoing a business transformation. Notice they're still separate, right? We're still not quite working together. And undergoing an IT transformation might be things like introducing agile development methodologies, um, DevOps type practices, um, how we develop and deliver and deploy uh, technologies. So that's still confined to IT. And we also see within business units where um, different parts of the business, maybe the marketing department, for example, is starting to work on doing experiments and um, introducing um, new products and services to the external customers of the company in a more agile way. So that activity has been happening in organizations for what, 10 years or so now? But here's what has to happen. And there are some really great stories that are coming out of the DevOps community that speak to the fact that um, digital transformation really is about the entire organization end to end working together to leverage digital technology to make significant improvements. And that word significant is underlined for a reason. It's really about, and I love this quote from the High Velocity IT publication, digital transformation enables an organization to do business significantly differently or to do significantly different, different business. Now, what does that mean? So an example of doing business significantly differently is what we're 
all currently experiencing, having a significant portion of your workforce working from their home offices, right? Having the ability um, within your inter within your organization to maybe have the internal parts of your organization um, work collaboratively over a common set of technologies or um, maybe um, streamlining our value streams within our organization and, and being able to automate those end to end, right? So we've really seen um, that ability to, within our organization, work in a very, very different way. Another example of that could be having an organization that's historically been a brick and mortar store and have them be able to also um, deliver goods and services via their website. Doing significantly different business speaks to, and we're all familiar with these models at this point, things like Uber, right? And, 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 the, and the different types of um, little businesses, and I'm using air quotes here when I use little, um, completely different industries that have emerged that could not have emerged in a traditional non-digital way, right? So it's really that significant improvement that we see in terms of how we work within our organization and how we do business as an organization. There's tremendous opportunity that opens up when we really figure out as an organization how to leverage digital technology. Now, before I talk about high velocity AT, let's talk about the concept of velocity. And very often people incorrectly associate velocity with speed, but it is very important to understand that by definition, there's a direction aspect to velocity. So it's high speed, but it's high speed in the right direction. So who cares if you as an organization have gotten good at doing something and you're able to do it very, very quickly, um, but it's not contributing to the bottom line of your organization. And there's some really good stories that are starting to come out of the DevOps community that really speak to this, that what they saw in, in these highest performing organizations and in these lead performing organizations is they saw that they were getting good at practices like continuous integration and continuous delivery. And, but the changes still hadn't occurred within the business units, right? To enable them to truly leverage these agile ways of working. So IT was capable of making changes very, very quickly, but the business unit still wanted to see fully fleshed out requirements definition documents or the business units were still operating off of a annual budgeting cycle um, they didn't want to come to the product demonstrations in order to give feedback on the features they just wanted to see a fully featured product released right let us know when it's all done so if if, if we have parts of the organization work at high speed, but the entire end-to-end -end organization isn't, we're still not going to achieve the results of high-velocity IT. So high-velocity IT is where we're really achieving that significant business enablement, right? We can do business significantly differently. We can do significantly different types of business where speed is crucial. And this is a really key consideration. And there are degrees of velocity that are going to be appropriate within your organization. So you may, and it's absolutely appropriate, that you have some parts of your organization where we don't necessarily have to undergo the cost and the culture change that's associated with achieving high velocity IT. And it's very common to see organizations today where there is a part of your organization that is, and I like to say, keeping the trains running on time. In other words, this is your core business. Maybe this is a business model that your founding fathers started 100 years ago, right? And that core part of your business is still a viable part of your business, but it's not um, necessarily catering to the needs of your customers who are looking for services and products that are being delivered via 
um, digital technologies. So there are going to be other parts of your organization where speed really is crucial, where time to market is going to make the difference in terms of whether or not you attract the customers you want or not. Time to customer is going to make a difference in terms of whether or not you keep those customers or they go and take their business to another company that's able to change their products and evolve their products more quickly. And certainly time to change, just recognizing that the world has changed. We within our organizations need to change and, and some organizations need to change more quickly than others or the very survival of their organization may be at stake. So again, I wanna emphasize that what we talk about in high velocity IT enables higher degrees and it's gonna be lesser or higher based on the needs of your organization, the circumstances of your organization, but it absolutely is acknowledged that there is a cost. So for some organizations, the cost may be too great. The culture change associated with achieving high velocity IT might be too great. And, and maybe what we can say is right now, right? And, and, that, and that that's gonna change over time, that there's going to come become a point where um, your organization realizes um, that need to change or at least to um, achieve higher levels of velocity in some parts of your organization. And again, it's not restricted to fast development. So we're not just talking about the IT department here. We're talking about the entire organization from innovation. Somebody anywhere in your company has an idea through to how we develop and deploy and eventually realize value from that idea. And, and again, that, that spans the entire organization. It's not just an IT thing. It's not just something that needs to occur within the business units. It needs to occur with those two organizations working together. And that's really why you see in the highest performing organizations where very often now IT is actually being embedded into the business unit. So you see much more of a focus on product oriented teams um, or you see within different business units of, of the organization, there is IT um, that, that again is embedded into that part of the business. Now that doesn't mean you might not still have some aspects of a central IT department for things like your common platforms and, um, and, and your enablement platforms. But in terms of your business systems, the future really lies in cross-functional business and IT teams working together. So I wanna talk for a minute about three aspects of high velocity IT, objectives, behaviors, and characteristics. So you can see here the five objectives of high velocity IT. And one of the things I love about these five objectives, valuable investments, fast development, resilient operations, value co-creation and assured conformance, is we're not being challenged to sacrifice one objective over the other. And I think that's really important to acknowledge and recognize. In some organizations, you know, there's this big focus on development um, and very often software development and it's all about speed. And there seems to not be the recognition that you can put poor quality and co a code into production really, really quickly uh, if you want to. The question is, what's, what's that gonna do to the stability and the resiliency of your organization? So we can't sacrifice one for the other. We have to be thinking about what investments that we're making and making sure that we're making the right investments. And here we see, um, and we talk about in HVIT how portfolio management is changing, how um, 
practices like relationship management are, 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 are changing as we introduce concepts like product ownership and as we really get better at understanding how to um, determine and make investment decisions. And um, I had some interesting conversation with someone recently about Prince2 and he was sharing with me that in Prince2, projects are constantly being challenged to justify their existence. And if at any point in time, it is determined that this project's never gonna see the return on investment that we expected when we started this project, the project gets killed. And that's an important concept because it makes us understand that we have to be really conscious of what investments we're making and that and those investment decisions have to be made continuously it can't be something where we make a decision and then we march forward with a plan without ever having looked at and tried to determine has our perspective in terms of whether we can realize an investment um, changed we see with um, co-created value the importance of practices like relationship management of the service desk practice. And I was a service desk manager at one point in my career, so it's very exciting to me that service desk has been elevated to a practice. Um, service design, right? Making sure that we really are um, using design thinking principles and working with our users and collaborating with our users to co-create that value. Resilient operations, certainly our, our warranty processes, availability, capacity management, looking at things like problem management, and also really understanding um, the nature of some of our um, um, controversial, I'm gonna use the word controversial for lack of a better word, some of our controversial practices that we're starting to see emerge like chaos engineering, where we're intentionally introducing disruption into our environment to see how resilient our environment is. And also certainly site reliability engineering comes into play with resilient operation, um, things like enhanced monitoring. We talk here about technical debt, right? And the impact that technical debt has on our organizations. Assured conformance certainly speaks to things like information security management and risk management, how we're making sure from um, a governance standpoint, from an audit defense standpoint, right, that we're doing everything that we can to comply with, you know, what other, uh, whatever regulatory controls or um, uh, laws that we need to be complying with in our organizations. And then certainly fast development, really understanding that here we see where concepts like the cloud and infrastructure of code have really changed the game. Um, loosely coupled architectures that enable us to make very small changes very quickly. We see here things like continuous integration and continuous delivery practices um, coming into play. And also agile and lean practices like Kanban, right? And and, and looking at those ways in which we're able to um, improve the flow of work within our organization. So very different changes in terms of practices like software development management and things like service validation and testing, right? How we are able to do continuous testing. Um, very much, and I think this is such a critical change that they made and an important change they made in IDLE 4 is decoupling deployment management and release management, understanding that those are two separate and distinct um, disciplines and that we now have much greater ability to mitigate the risk of making changes because we have decoupled uh, those two practices. So five objectives that really cascade down from the strategy of your organization and really enable you within your organization to keep your eyes on the prize, right? None of these is mutually exclusive. We really need to make sure that we're investing in how we can achieve all of these objectives and looking at the indicators for all of these objectives and understanding that if we over invest one area in one area, it's likely that we're gonna see 
value leakage, right? We're not going to reap the benefits in some other area. So I love this quote from Owen Pringle, who's a digital strategist. In successful transformation, a lot of changes aren't about asking for new money, but spending it differently. And I think that's a great message for a lot of our organizations. A lot of you maybe have in your organization's projects that, gosh, you've got this fleeting thought, right? This is never going to be successful, but you continue to throw money at it. Or you, you've got tons of tools um, within your organization, but you're still asking for new money in order to buy some new tool. How can we look at what resources we have now and figure out how to use them differently in order to support and achieve the objectives of high velocity IT. We also see five key behavioral patterns for high velocity IT. Accept ambiguity and uncertainty. It, you know, and, and this is a reality that we've lived in in, you know, for a long time, of especially those of us who work in the IT uh, profession. Trust and be trusted, continually raise the bar help customers get their job done, and commit to continual learning. And a lot of the guiding principles and the models and the concepts that we talk about in the context of these behaviors really translate into and inform the way we do things around here. So these behaviors, and if you've ever looked in the definition of culture, culture's really about behaviors, right? Um, these behavior patterns really are going to, over time, change the culture within your organization. So with accept ambiguity, we look at things like complexity thinking and systems thinking, um, understanding that idea that best practices are great when we know our environments and we have you know, a clear approach to managing our environments, but there are some environments where we really have to look at things from an experimentation standpoint. We have to look at uh, emerging practices and those exploratory practices and understand that this is, this is the way it's going to be and, and the way it really has been. Um, for a very long time, that things are going to be constantly evolving, and we just need to accept that. Trust and be trusted speaks to concepts like safety culture and that ability to not be to be yourself within your organization, to not be afraid uh, to speak up, to um, have that kind of honest and open, transparent communication across your organization. Things like ethics come into play here, and really ethics can apply to all of these behavior patterns in terms of looking at how we deal with the dilemmas that we face within our organization as um, technology changes the way our society operates, and technology in some cases really influences, if you look at the influence of, of, of things like Facebook and messaging, right? Uh, within our, our world today, that's, that, that's all changing significantly. So things like ethics come into play here. Continually raising the bar, and these are really, this is really kind of the underlying principle behind things like agile and lean and continual improvement. Um, we talk about, um, and, and, and with commit to continual learning as well, we talk about things like um, the continual improvement model and Toyota Kata, and really accepting the fact that everything can always be better. <laughs> Nothing is ever done. What we do need to get to in, in this day and age is a place where our products and our services are good for right now. It's better to have something done and deployed than have it be perfect. And know that and Build enough slack in your system that you can circle back around and then based on customer feedback, based on feedback from your stakeholders, you continually improve and evolve things and do that in a very agile way. So it can be those small incremental changes as opposed to having to fund yet another one year project, right? That's gonna start off with a big robust requirements definition document. And then certainly, helping customers get their job done. So 
service dominant knowledge, that idea of co-creating value with our customers, techniques like design thinking come into play here to introduce those new ways of interacting with our users and collaborating with our, the, the stakeholders uh, within our organization. So very important to understand that this is the world we live in today. I love this uh, quote from John Davey, also a digital strategist. The pace of change will accelerate and the impact of that change will be more far reaching than it's possible to imagine. And this quote was actually from like 2015, right? So think about this quote in the context of where we are today. And I, and I do think that organizations that have been able to adapt very, very quickly to the really difficult um, times that we're living in right now are never gonna be able to roll that back, right? Now that organizations see that they are in fact capable of changing very, very quickly in order to adapt to changing needs, the business, when things return to our new normal, whatever that is, um, the, 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 the business is going to be saying, let's do that again, and let's continue to do that. We're, we're, it, it's going to be very, very difficult to go back to um, kind of our traditional, very methodical um, ways of working. And quite frankly, we as consumers who have now maybe gotten a taste of some services that we wouldn't necessarily have taken advantage of in the past. Maybe in the past, we wouldn't necessarily um, bother with having groceries delivered to our doorstep. We've done that now and we've realized some of us, mm, not so bad, maybe I'll do that, you know, not all the time, but in times when I'm really busy, right? So everything is changing and the pace of that change isn't gonna slow down ever again. Um, and, and certainly not anytime soon. And then the key characteristics of high velocity IT. And here's where, again, you see some of these core um, and um, adjacent disciplines coming into play, lean, agile, continuous, resilient, and understanding that when we bring these together, there's no one that's any better than the other. There is no or in this conversation. It's not agile or DevOps. It's not DevOps or idle. It's not lean or anything else. It's really understanding that when we bring all of these ways of working together, we really reap the most benefits. So lean through things like value stream mapping helps us to improve throughput and look at how we can reduce waste. Again, across the value stream. I think one of the things that we've learned is that by being process focused, we, you know, in some organizations have done nothing but create a set of silos, right? Just like we have functional silos, you know, teams of specialists working together and they don't work and play well together. In some organizations, our processes aren't necessarily integrated and working effectively together. So by taking things up to a value stream level, we're really able to improve that flow, improve throughput across our organization. Agile, again, taking that iterative approach and doing it in a very, very collaborative way with our stakeholders. Resilience, looking at things like availability and performance and recognizing again that we cannot sacrifice that for speed. And um, I think we, here's where we're gonna see things like site reliability really, uh, engineering really emerge. You know, site reliability engineering is on a similar trajectory to DevOps in that DevOps initially, you saw it in, you know, kind of the unicorns, the Facebooks, the you know, the Googles, right? Uh, those high performing organizations and then it, it it came into the enterprise and now it's, you know, the, by virtue of the fact that we're talking about it in the context of idle, it's now viewed as best practice uh, within organizations. And site reliability is on the same path. It had, you know, a similar start. Google literally wrote the book on site reliability engineering. You see these practices being introduced in these kind of high volume, high transaction organizations, but it's now finding its way into the enterprise. In fact, 
and this is going back several years now, the first time I ever heard about site reliability engineering, I heard about it from somebody from Home Depot, right? So um, SRE is coming to an enterprise near you and, and, and if it's not already there. And then certainly continuous, continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous testing, continuous monitoring, right? Take just about any continuous improvement. Take just about anything we do in this day and age and understand that it needs to be continuous. Um, that's not to say that there aren't some places where a traditional waterfall approach uh, to a project might not still be appropriate, um, but those cases are very specific and they are few and far between. The better we can get at continuous, um, the better off we're going to be. And it's, it, it, again, is one of those kind of fundamental characteristics of high velocity IT that enable you to co-create value with our customers. So I love this quote from Julie Dodd, who really has, is talking about how a lot of, uh, how our society is changing um, by the introduction of um, digital technology. This is not a question of changing skill set, it's a changing of mindset. So a lot of times we focus on the skills and what technologies do we need to know, but really it's important to recognize that the technologies are changing as we speak, they're gonna to continue to change. Um, and maybe the first place we need to start with in our organizations is the changing mindset. One of the questions we got coming into this webinar was, um, does this really talk about Agile and Lean and DevOps? So hopefully you've seen the answer is yes. And the um, author of this question specifically asked about budgeting and you know how do we deal with those situations where we're on an annual budgeting cycle, right? And, and, and so it's hard to um, reconcile that with these Agile ways of working. And I honestly, it, I don't think it's specifically talked about in HVIT. I did a quick look through the book and didn't find anything specific, but certainly this idea of changing those mindsets in terms of how we make investment decisions um, and looking at things from, needing to look at things from the Agile perspective is it, it, very much emphasized here. And I think you have a great question, and I'm going to post that to the Axelos folks so that the next release of HVIT, they talk about that. DevOps Leader actually does, in fact, talk about the need to shift away from kind of that annual budgeting cycle to more of a continuous budgeting cycle. There's a little section in DevOps Leader that does talk about that. So all of these things, you know, it, all these like puzzle pieces are interconnected and we've got to change the way we think about the ways we're working. So this is big, right? Transformation, the word transformation in and of itself really speaks to the need for major change. And it's recognized that this is often gonna translate into a major investment, whether it's in technology, whether it's in upskilling, uh, your employees within your organization. It may require an organizational change, but it's important not to lead with that. Step one, some of you who are familiar with DevOps may be familiar with the Spotify organizational model, which is really kind of touted as helping a very large organization to work in an agile way. Step one is not to reorganize to the Spotify model and Spotify would tell you that. They tell you that their culture is very unique, right? And that this organizational model sorts, suits their culture. But do recognize that, as I mentioned, I think we're gonna very much see um, this move to more product-oriented teams um, that are brought together for a, you know, a, a, a longer uh, period of time so that the teams can come together, they can go through the whole forming, norming, storming, performing phases. Um, and they can really become, you know, as a cross-functional team, IT professionals working with business professionals um, can really get to know their customers and make sure that they're evolving their products and services in a way that makes sure that it meets the needs of their customers. So one of my favorite guiding principles, start where you are, understand that 
really each and every organization, no matter what you do, you just need to look at what are the goals of your organization, what are the strategies for your particular uh, organization, and you know what, those strategies might be changing as we speak because this crisis is really challenging some organizations to kind of rethink what their go forward um, model is going to look like. So progress iteratively with feedback. Understand that we're, we're, we're never done and what we have to be doing in this day and age is listen, be listening to our customers, um, to be really appreciating the experience of our customers and, and are we doing things in a way because it makes sense for our organization and it, it reflects the policies and the processes of our organization that maybe got put in place in a different day and age and so aren't even relevant anymore, um, but they're not necessarily meeting the needs of our customers. So we've got to constantly listen to our customers, listen to our stakeholders, progress iteratively with the feedback that we get um, from those stakeholders. So high velocity IT is one of the managing professional uh, modules within the Idle 4 certification scheme. Um, create, deliver, and support really focuses on value streams and how to um, leverage value streams. Um, in the context of things like developing new products and services and providing support for our existing products and services. Drive stakeholder value is really about the customer journey and making sure that we are, are in fact, uh, focusing on that customer experience and finding ways to improve that customer experience. I talked just now about high velocity IT. And direct plan and improve really speaks to the governance model that we have within, in place within our organization. Direct really speaks to right that how we how we how we govern within our organizations, how we make strategic plans, tactical plans, cascade them down to um, operational plans, and then continuous improvement. And um, you know. I think one of the things that you see in any Idle 4 publication that focuses on continual improvement, there's really very much an emphasis now on understanding the role of experimentation in continuous improvement. Understanding that this is not just about kind of putting together a little plan that speaks to, um, okay, we wanna make this improvement, here's the steps we're gonna take in order to make that improvement, but here's an area that we need to improve what are some of the approaches that we can use to make improvements, conduct a series of safe to fail experiments, and then really look at and determine um, which is the best way forward. And last but not least, digital and IT strategy is currently in development. We haven't received any type of information about when digital and IT strategy is going to be available. I expect that it's gonna be you know, the second half of the year, um, but I know that there's a lot of people right now who are working very, very hard uh, to, to, to pull that book together. Some of you out there may in fact be reviewers uh, of that publication or contributing to that publication in some way, and I'm sure you, you, you know as well that folks are working hard uh, to pull that together. I also want to mention, if you're not aware, that you know the way Idle 4 is structured, we have the core publications and the certification classes. And for each certification course, there is, in fact, a, a publication associated with that certification, right? That is the focus of that particular certification. All of these core publications and all of these certification classes pull from the practice guides. So the practice guides are separate and distinct documents, and there's a guide for each of the Idle 4 practices. And those practices are available online through My Idle. So if you've already attended a course with us, or if you attend a course with us, any Idle certification, you get a free one-year subscription to be able to access those uh, practice guides. And I love part of the motivation in decoupling those two is really recognition 
that a practice, pick a practice, any practice, a practice could actually underpin any one of these core publications. So you don't see where there's one book and that's the only place where you see service desk talked about, or that's the only place where you see change enablement talked about. If it's appropriate to bring a practice into a publication in a given context, it will be brought into that publication in that context, right? In the context of that publication. So what kind of questions do I have? Who's gonna, who's gonna give me some questions about uh, what everybody thinks about what they learned? So Donna, we don't have any questions yet, but please send them in. That was fantastic. I just learned a lot, but it was a lot of information. I'm, my brain's still thinking a little bit, so. <laughs> well, again, we did early on, we got kind of the two questions. So to the person who asked the question about the annual approved money, capital expenditures versus op operational expenditures, I can't say that that specifically is talked about in HVIT. I'm going to do a little deeper dive after the session. Um, but but again, I think I think you've got an awesome point. And um, I'll pass that feedback along to Axelos. Um, one of the other questions that got asked had to do with, you know, organizations where there's really strict policies in place, right? And so how do we introduce these new ways of working. So if you work in that type of an organization, I, I, and I'm not trying to sell you anything, but I'm gonna sell you something. <laughs> um, DPI, that's really what DPI, Direct Plan and Improve, is all about. Direct Plan and Improve has a whole section that talks about having um, policies and guidelines and controls that are sufficient but not excessive is the exact wording in the publication and I think that's beautiful wording so they really do an awesome job of saying look there absolutely are some places where you need to have strict policies in place and it makes sense or perhaps controls because there's legal considerations there's regulatory uh, controls that we have to satisfy and there's some places where guidelines are appropriate and that's kind of what the guiding principles are all about give people some boundaries right and 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 kind of help them understand how to operate right you know what are the guiding approaches that we're going to use as we go forward and then give people the flexibility to innovate and to experiment and to try new ways of working so use them where they are appropriate um, one of the things we talk about in HVIT, in fact, is complexity thinking. And complexity thinking, for any of you who are familiar with models like Kinefin, um, speak to the same thing, right? Understanding that there are places where best practices are appropriate and we want to apply them. But there are best practices where we have to think about new ways of working, right? And, and, and using best practices is going to get in our way. Right, it's, it's one of the reasons why there's a little bit of pushback in the DevOps community to IDLE because IDLE was in fact very often interpreted in organizations as prescriptive and that IDLE was not that, but it was interpreted that way. And um, it, some, of more, some organizations, their policies and their ways of working were standing in the way of introducing these new practices like CICD. So um, kind of recognizing that need to, when, when it's appropriate to look for emerging ways of working. Um, one of the things that's really interesting um, about Spotify, for example, and one of their great quotes is, um, we think it's more important to be agile than do agile. Um, very early on, they introduced Scrum within their organization, and then they actually found that Scrum rules and Scrum ways of working were getting in their way, right? That they were, like idle, being, being um, perceived as too prescriptive and, too, and, and kind of too specific in, 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 in terms of the ways of working. And so um, they've, they've come up with, you know, again, this emphasis on being agile as opposed to strictly following any one framework or discipline. Leverage them, right? Understand the lessons of those different ways of working and then kind of forge your own way of working. So um, 
I hope I answered that particular question. And then someone else, another part of someone's question had to do with competing business priorities. Um, and HVIT absolutely does speak to that. The whole section on fast development um, really talks about how you make investment decisions within your organization, techniques like cost of delay and um, understanding um, you know, how we can, uh, from a portfolio management standpoint, look at how we're how we're making those decisions, um, especially when there's things like conflicting priorities, you know, relationship management, practices like relationship management come into play here. So any new questions um, that came in? Yes. I was yes, there are. <laughs> well, first of all, there are just a ton of compliments, including um, Mark Smiley is on, I said smiley and I'm saying smiley, is on the call with us and I'm gonna put in the chat what Mark said. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know, Mark Smalley was the brilliant lead author for this particular uh, publication and um, gosh, Mark, I'm gonna get it wrong too. Uh, Mark has actually published a little ancillary book it, oh gosh i'm reading it right now too it's like uh I'm behind hvit and forgive me it's something to that effect look for mark's molly and um he's kind of talking about the process of creating this publication and all the different individuals that uh he worked with um and uh so, and I had the privilege of working, um, some of you may be familiar, I'm on the IDLE 4 exam panel, so I had the privilege of working with Mark during the development process, and um, and uh, just brilliant job, Mark, just, again, I, I know you're not supposed to have favorites, but this is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so Mark had sent in two links, one was to the Exodus case study, which I have read and is very very good and then the other is to his musings um which i have not had an opportunity to read but i certainly will um, yeah, and mark says awesome. that you are too kind she is kind but she's also correct mark so um judy i think this is more of a comment hvit is much needed right now during the pandemic we agree judy so organizations who already are working from home will need to mature their strategies to remain competitive Others will need to get on board as quickly as possible. Great job, Donna. Um, yeah. Any, and, you I, know, okay. I want to give you a really quick example. So I, like many of you, order pizza in the course of all of this. And I was fascinated by how quickly my local little pizza place had modified their website to have a little box that I could click on to say, yes, I want contactless delivery and to provide instructions, right? I mean, that's DevOps in action, right? That's CICD in action. There's an idea, somebody changes the code, you push it through a CICD pipeline and it gets deployed to your website. And that can happen very, very quickly. And so you see some of these responses that you're seeing in organizations today, I believe really are having that foundation of high velocity capability. Um, and and for the and and conversely, we've heard from organizations who are in the education community who have said, "Gosh, you know, we've known all along that we maybe needed to try to move to working in the virtual classroom, but we just, you know, we hadn't gotten there yet, and you know, we still have a lot of, you know, our customer community who who enjoys being in the physical classroom, but here we are, right? So it it's never going to be the same. It's just never going to be the same." Yeah, and Mark makes an interesting point, which actually I, I've been um, in class the last couple of days and we've had this, what I think Mark is talking about, the same conversation that this, for, you know, if we're going to take some silver lining out of what we're all learning through Corona is that, you know, Mark saying, re Corona, working in complex environments in HVIT, it's allowing for parallel experiments. And, you know, mm -hmm. in our class, we've had a lot of conversations about if if this when we when we come out of this what we're going to learn from it and you know um, smart thinkers and organizations are sort of pivoting to look at it while inside of it as an experiment yeah. and yeah really interesting yep exactly um, so Fadi is asking any ideas around HVIT 
with small teams, 10 or less? I love that question. Well, if you look at, um, you know, agile as a concept, it often emphasizes those small teams. Now, one of the things that's a little bit different is the um, aspect of that team being a cross-functional team, right? Um, and, and also autonomy very much comes into play. Um, so I think, I think, you know, I don't care what size your team is, um, some of the uh, objectives you can embrace, certainly the guiding principles you can embrace, um, things like trust and be trusted, accept ambiguity and uncertainty, right? Commit to continual learning, those behaviors, it really doesn't matter what size team you have, you know, or what size organization you even have. These concepts can be applied to any organization. Now, again, to achieve, you know, kind of faster flow um, in, in, in terms of your products and services, then, then really the question becomes, again, are you um, a cross-functional team? Do you have the skill sets within your organization that you need to work autonomously? And if not, how can you scale up, right? How can you either bring people into your team or develop the skills that you need into, in order to increase your uh, ability to work autonomously. That's why value streams, I think, are so important, that when you look at value streams, and it's very common for under organizations that undergo value stream mapping exercises to see that what should take you know, hours um, is taking weeks. And very often, why it's taking weeks is because there's big chunks of wait time as work m moves from one team to another team, to another team. And so very often the way you address that is by trying to look at where there's opportunities to um, consolidate those teams, eliminate those handoffs, right? And have more work being done by a cross-functional team. So I hope that answered your question. I I think that it did. Yep, buddy is saying thank you, it did. Um, okay. So <clears throat> Greg has a question about Velocity is a term that their agile team throws around. I like that expression, throws around, but I don't know that they're really measuring velocity correctly. The rest of us don't talk today in terms of velocity. So how do we, without going to, I think what he's asking is without going to a really traditional burn down chart, Kanban board, agile way of looking at velocity from a service management perspective, how do we start to determine based on what our velocity is today to know what to improve? Well, I, I mean, I think, and and Greg, I think you're maybe talking about in the context of Agile, the term velocity is very often used. And in that context, I, I always think it's worth emphasizing that velocity is um, uh, understood in hindsight, right? So sometimes you see Agile teams talk about their velocity and their velocity is that they can complete, you know, I don't know, whatever, four items in a sprint. And that had to be determined over time, right? They did a bunch of sprints where they successfully were able to complete four items, right, during that sprint. Um, so their, their velocity has been proven. Um, so, you know, I think it's a slightly different context, but, you know, I, I do think the definition that we use here, and it's a little bit more of a kind of dictionary definition of just understanding the speed at which we're moving and and understanding that that's going to be, again, something that is is understood in hindsight, right? We, we've successfully proven that, you know, we've reduced the time it takes us from somebody having an idea within our organization to our being able to realize value from that. It, it, um, I hope that makes sense. So it's not um, kind of predictive, it's more reflective. Yep, Greg says got it. Um, so just, it is at the hour, we've got a couple more questions. So let me just say this, next month's webinar, we're doing a back-to-back, -back, it's a Donna-a-thon. 
Um, Donna is going to be talking to us next month about another one of the Idle 4 books. I'm going to say Drive Stakeholder Value. DSV. Gosh darn it, I knew that. So uh, Driving Stakeholder Value, which well, Donna's favorite is HVAT, my favorite is DSV, so I really should have remembered it. I'm very excited to, uh, to learn from that. On the way out, you're going to be hit with a survey question for ideas and suggestions for future webinars. We really use that to build our calendar. Please, um, please complete that for us. Also, I know there are a lot of practitioners on this call. What y'all love the most is hearing from practitioners. We need practitioners to step up, to have practitioners to speak. And Donna or myself, other team members are happy to personally work with you to get yes. that presentation ready. So if you're mm -hmm. thinking about uh, once travel restrictions are gone, submitting to present at a conference, as example, we're a good testing ground for that. So, you know, I kn we know you want to hear from practitioners. You're the practitioners. Um, but Donna, so if anybody who has to go, thanks again for joining us. We love having you all here. Donna, we had a ton of people today. And I, I think we've got two more questions, but did you have a polling question? You want to throw that up now for those that are still here? Or is it? I don't know what it is, so I don't know if it's um, well. If it's an, I, and, and unfortunately, the, I don't have control over it. So, Nina, if you can look, can you get the oh, poll I can launch? do it. Uh, which one? How familiar or which describes? Either one. I'm gonna go with which describes. Launch. So, uh, throwing up a polling question for you guys that are um, still hanging out with us. Um, Donna, so many people saying <laughs> saying how great it was. Uh, Mike Weaver, he just feels always feels informed and inspired by Donna. Thanks, ITSM Academy. Thank Mike, you. that's why you're a favorite. Um, mm -hmm. And the other, oh, okay. The other questions are about um, the training. Yes, we have built slash are building, as Donna said at the beginning, all of the idle for courses. There is not yet a retirement date on managing professional. We are planning on running, well, we're definitely running one in June and another one November timeframe. And then depending on when the retirement is, we might um, throw at least one more public class in there. Um, and to to Mary number two, there is a, yes, we did put together a pass in our public classroom. So excuse me, I'm going to send that out to everyone if you are interested. Um, any other and, and questions about HVIT? The rest of them are all about training. So. Oh, okay. Well, and, and I would just say with regard to the managing professional courses, Create, Deliver, and Support is live. Direct, Plan, and Improve is live. HVIT goes live in two weeks. Um, and Drive Stakeholder Value goes live in July. So at that point, all four of the managing professional courses are up and, and rolling and available. And uh, again, digital and IT strategy coming soon. So we've 5%. Mark Smalley, we've achieved HVIT where needed, which is awesome. I, 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 I intentionally put where needed in there because hopefully everybody took away the message that this is just, you have to kind of look at the circumstances of your organization. 29%, um, the cost and culture change might be prohibitive. And I get that, you know, organizations, you know, if you're still having conversations about things like Agile and DevOps, right, then, you know, HIT is maybe next level for you. It, it, you know, it kind of depends on um, your organization and, and, and its operating model. Speed is crucial to the entire organization. I love 24% of you recognizing that this isn't an IT thing, right? Uh, and, you know, it, it can't be about IT being really good at Agile and CICD if the business still wants quarterly releases, right? Who cares? <laughs> That you've gotten really good at making changes really quickly if they're going to stack up behind a release window. You got to deploy stuff. And 43% parts are being challenged to speed up, right? Yeah. So, and that, and I get that, you know, you're, it's very common to see organizations where part of your organization is really being challenged to focus on, you know, efficiency and, 
you know, cost efficiency, you know, maybe those core parts of your business. And, um, and then there's an innovation, I don't know, arm of the organization, so to speak, that, you know, I'm sure is being challenged to speed up. So interesting, very interesting well, stats. I also think that's interesting if this, I understand why you post it as a single answer, but I wonder if it would have been multiple answers, what that 43% would have looked like. I think if there could have been two options, um, a lot of more people even would have picked that option. So, um, and those are it for the HVIT related questions. Right. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Very much appreciate it. Uh, I'm always excited about every every uh, webinar and every course we deliver. Um, I was particularly excited about this one, and and uh, I hope you found it useful. I think it's just it's the world we're living in, right? It just it. You know, it, it kind of pulls together, you know, all the different things. And, you know, one of the things, I'm an educator, I'm a lifelong learner, so one of the things I particularly love about this class is, you know, pretty much anybody who attends is going to have something where you go, oh, man, I don't know anything about that. Let me go learn more, right? So you're not necessarily going to learn everything that there is to know about it, but it's going to open you up to something, you know, and 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 then it's going to send you on a journey, right? To go to learn more about whatever the topic is, and that's to me that's a big part of what lifelong learning is all about: not being afraid to chase those rabbit holes, uh, because that's how you change your mindset. So thank you all very much for for uh, participating this morning, and be well, be safe. Yes, Take stay care. home. Thank you very much, Donna. Stay. As always, I learned a bunch. I will talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. All right. See y'all. Thank you.